So welcome to the industry day here at the Natural Stone Show. So this morning we're going to be hearing about how the industry is really promoting diversity, tackling the skills gap, and we're going to be looking at trying to maximize the opportunities created by changes to the local authority planning process. Now, it is uh, really good to see the growing number of uh, women represented in the industry, represented here uh, today. Women aren't as rare in the industry as they used to. But this, though, is still really quite a white male dominated industry. So it's missing out on the skills, really, that would create a more diverse uh, workforce and the opportunities that that would deliver. But it is really encouraging to see that more and more women are seeing uh, this industry as one to make a career in. Despite the positive changes we've seen, there is still a lot more to be done. And this is where women in natural stone comes in. This organization was formed really to uh, try and attract many more women into the really successful areas of the industry um, from the architectural and engineering side of the construction business to its events as well and that's what it's encouraging people to take part in so many different events that, that the organization uh, runs and so today we're going to be hearing from Becca Cranfield I'm really pleased to say he's here in the audience co-chair of WINS and is a director of the company Athena Stonecare so she's going to be telling us about WINS and all of its plans. Of course, another way of attracting and retaining really good people in the industry is by giving them a really good career path. And that is why also uh, the Stone Academy has been launched. It's being launched here at the Natural Stone Show. And Chris Kelsey, who is president of the Stone Federation Great Britain, will be here to tell us more about the plans and what this academy aims to achieve. And the final presentation this morning comes from Sam Thistlethwaite, who's a planning consultant and director of IC Planning. And he's been advising the Stone uh, Federation on all of the changing planning regulations and really leading the Federation's representations to government um, to really ensure that the industry is a really important part of building better, the Building Beautiful initiatives. So he's going to be telling us uh, more about that as well. So a really packed agenda. We'll have a discussion as well uh, right at the end of those presentations. And I really would urge you all to try and take part. Do raise your hand if you've got a question that you want to put to any of our speakers. Otherwise, I'll be posing all the questions. And I'd really like uh, to hear from you as well at any step of the way. But first, let's hear about Women in Natural Stone from Becca Cranfield. Welcome, Becca. Oh, so thank you so much for that kind introduction, Susanna. Um, and thank you for inviting me along to talk today about women in natural stone. Um, it's a really exciting moment for me, um, but it's a really, really pertinent moment for the industry as well. So the last time I was here um, was four years ago, and it was my very first stone show. Um, and back then, not only was women in natural stone not yet conceived as an idea, but actually, I think I probably saw very, very few women at the Stone Sham. So I'm going to go on to talk a little bit more about exactly what WINS is and what we're aiming to do um, and what we're planning for the future. But before I get stuck into the when and the how, um, I wanted to just take a few moments just to talk about my why. Um, why we need a group for women and, and more importantly, why it is so important for the industry because these are questions that I'm really often asked. There's a real misconception that women in groups are very highly feminism-driven movements or that they're anti-men, but this just simply isn't the case. It's about celebrating the diversity in our sector and the different skill sets that both men and women can bring to the natural stone industry. And ultimately, that can drive business for all of us. So a little on my journey. As the youngest of four children, I grew up with two elder brothers. So I spent most of my childhood idolizing them, um, looking up to them and trying to do everything that they could and, and be. And in turn, they treated me like a little mini version of themselves. I didn't even consider that boys and girls and men and women might have different roles or that they might be viewed as anything other than equal. 
It probably helped that being born in the 90s, I also spent most of my childhood wearing boys' clothes that were hand-me-downs. So that probably confused things a little bit. It wasn't until I was an adult and I entered the world of work that I started to realise that gender could separate people and the impact that that could have. I spent my early career in the charity sector working in female cancer charities and they were heavily dominated by women. However, the managers and directors were all male. There was a moment early in my career which really shaped me and that was when my CEO took my manager to one side and he asked if he could swap me to attend an event in place of my counterpart, in spite of the fact that I'd had no involvement in the event and my counterpart had run the entire event up until then. In a nutshell, and he made it very clear that I was being chosen to go along because of to be something to look at, not something of value. It was a really small moment in career, but it really opened up my eyes. From that moment, I realised that I wanted to be recognised and respected for my work and my achievements, not in spite of being female, but just regardless of gender. So fast forward to when I entered into the stone industry five years ago. To say I felt a little bit out of my depth was an understatement. I often tell people of my journey four years ago to the first stone show that I attended with my husband And um, I asked him to give me like a really kind of whistle-stop tour of everything I needed to know about stone. I seemed to think that everyone was going to quiz me on the difference between a metamorphic and an igneous rock, which thankfully they didn't. Please don't ask me that question today either. Um, But I also, I remember the first ever Stone Federation event that I went to. Other than myself, the only other woman in the room was Jane, the CEO. And... I've always felt quite self-conscious of being viewed as just the wife of the managing director, as though my position in the company was gifted to me. I felt like I had a lot to prove when I entered the industry, but I also recognised that I had a lot to learn. My prior experience of being rewarded for my feminine attributes, head of my business acumen, had really stuck with me. So I did a lot of learning about the industry as well as how to run a business, and I did it on my own. Despite being a very confident person, I also really feared judgment. I didn't have a strong female role model who I could reach out to that I thought would help me, guide me, support me, celebrate me. And I was incredibly lucky that I do work with my husband and that he was able to provide incredible mentoring for me. And I must say that Claire, who founded the Women in Natural Stone originally, is one of the people who I've always been able to reach out to since I entered into the industry as well. I'm sure if I had reached out to anybody in the industry, then I would have found the support for them. But I do think it's in our nature to look for somebody to support us who we naturally naturally align with. Um, And so as a woman, that's reaching out to another woman. I know that I get really excited when I meet other women that are at the start of their career, knowing that I can help them, guide them and support them. And for me, that's why WINS is so important. The construction industry as a whole is really heavily male dominated, but there is a huge diversity of people in our sector when you dig a little deeper. There's two things that have really struck me about since getting involved with WINS. First is the passion, the huge passion across the industry for supporting young talent, regardless of gender and background. I witnessed huge enthusiasm from so many companies who want to find ways to support their team members. Several directors have personally reached out to me to ask if I can look out for members of their team who are coming along to events. And I've had huge amounts of comments after WINS events um, in thanks for looking out for those people and looking after these young, talented people. The second thing I've really been struck by since getting involved with WINS is the breadth of expertise that we have in the stone industry, the different ideas, the approaches, the expertise that we have at our fingertips. So by creating an industry that welcomes both men and women as equals, I think our sector's got a really good opportunity to become leaders in our approach to diversity and equality in the workforce. So 
how exactly are we doing this with women in natural stone? So there's three main elements to women in natural stone. That's connecting, supporting, and mentoring. To me, there's a fourth underlying element to him, and that's inspiring. So since launching in 2021, the first focus has been on identifying women in our industry and bringing them together to connect. We've so far hosted four networking events with over 200 women joining us. The format of the events is completely informal. We've aimed to provide a space that allows women to come together and form relationships, meet ideas and just connect with each other. We've welcomed women who are brand new to the industry as well as those who have many years of experience. The roles of the attendees have been hugely diverse too, from stonemasons, marketing managers, accountants, project managers, QS, you name it, we've had people from every part of the industry. We've had really good feedback from the event so far. So many people have commented on how grateful they are just to find out that there's another woman in the industry because they're the only one in their workplace. Um, on a personal note, I've really observed a few young women who they turn up and they almost look small. They kind of don't know what they're doing there. And throughout the evening, you just watch them slowly start to emerge like a butterfly and they're almost bouncing off the walls when they leave. It's incredible the amount of confidence from just meeting other people can, can give th these people. We also recently hosted a small networking event in Manchester, and this is a really important step for women in natural stone. It's the first of our regional events. Um, we are not London centric. The stone industry is far from London centric. Um, many companies work internationally even, um, and we have international women in natural stone members. So we want to ensure that no matter where anyone is based, everyone has the opportunity to be in part of WINS. To this end, we have also created a private LinkedIn group. And this is where the women from the, um, who attend the events can come together and they can continue to connect. It's a great platform for people to ask questions, gain advice from each other. I found it a really useful tool myself um, where I can ask technical questions that I might have been posed um, and get an engagement from a huge pool of experts without that fear of judgment that you might get if you just popped up a LinkedIn post and you get that one person who said something a little bit awkward or rude. At our recent event for International Women's Day, we also launched our mentoring program. Mentoring um, within WINS is designed to be informal and it's flexible to fit each partnership. The program runs for one year and we invite women who are early in their stone career to meet with someone who's more experienced, who can guide them and support them towards their specific goals. We've not outlined a step-by-step -step guide, but designed a mentoring framework to allow those relationships to grow organically. The scheme's been greeted with huge enthusiasm, and I'm really excited that we've matched 13 mentors and mentees who are already working together. Mentorships are a really important part of WINS and it's something that we're really passionate about. So following on from the success of the first year, we're looking to roll out an annual programme to continue to support women in their careers. It's a big step for the industry too, as it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate that we've got a structure in place to support and encourage young women in their roles. For companies that are looking to attract young talents, we, could we really encourage you to consider offering WINS mentoring as part of your induction program for young women. And if there's team members you think would benefit this from this, then please come along and speak to somebody, either myself or Tamsin or someone from the Stone Federation. Whilst we talk about that connecting, the supporting and mentoring, um, there is also that underlying fourth element of WINS. And that's inspiring. And I think that's something that runs throughout everything we do. And I think it's really important for everyone here. The stone sector is a hugely welcoming industry. And it's one of the things that's really struck me is that the collaborative approach across our sector. There's a large number of family run companies and also a lot of small businesses. And this means that we actually work together in a lot in a way that a lot of other industries just haven't managed to master. But like any other industry, we do need to continue to attract new talent and find ways to demonstrate that we are forward thinking and inclusive. Women in Natural Stone is really well positioned to do that. 
because we're showcasing that we have a diverse workforce who are celebrated and supported. For International Women's Day, we launched our first campaign that gave companies across the industry an opportunity to highlight the women within their team in a social media campaign. Alongside this, we also shared a series of interviews. I do like to think of myself as the Oprah Winfrey of the Stone World. Um, just talking to young women and finding out about their career. We also have a partnership with the Landscape Show um, where Wynn saw it initial, its initial launch. Having a presence at trade shows gives women in natural stone the chance to reach out to, to more women um, who are looking for guidance in their career and be part of a bigger movement, as well as giving us a chance to be part of a bigger movement um, to encourage women into the construction industry. So we're continuing to seek out further events and associations where we can bring the stone industry to the forefront of conversation about the need for a diverse workforce. We're also looking to inspire from within the industry too. With the training gaps in natural stone, something that we're all too aware of, and we're going to come on to talk about in a, little, in a, in a couple of moments. At the International Women's Day um, event, we held a small workshop and it was on the subject of confidence. We're looking to develop a series of similar workshops that will add a training arm to WINS, offering further support for women in our industry. One of the things that struck me when I sat down to think about how to explain women in natural stone today was just how much opportunity there is for everyone in the stone industry to benefit from women in natural stone. It's a really exciting moment for us all in the sector, and I'm hoping that just in this small space of time, I've managed to highlight this. We're really, really pleased to be able to share that with you today and would love more than anything to invite you along this afternoon to the Stone Hub, which you'll find right in the centre of the show, um, where we'll be doing coffee and pastries and biscuits. And it just gives you a chance to find out a little bit more about women in natural stone. And most importantly, this is open to everybody. We want you all to engage with how important this is and how much it can help everybody within the stone industry. Um, so thank you very much and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you later. Thank you. That was great. Um, it was really interesting, you know, you talking <laughs> about wins. It's a great acronym, isn't it? It certainly shows that Win and Natural Stone have a winning approach. <laughs> um, but do you think that really it's un underestimated the benefit of transferable skills? Because you talked about working in the charity sector and you've segued. I know that, you know, they had a few hurdles uh, to get over, yeah. but you've segued, segued so well and now are kind of a leader in this space. Yeah. Do you think companies just don't fully appreciate how transferable skills really are? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's something that people don't always realise that actually within the industry there is every single different role. And actually, again, because we're quite a... A lot of businesses are quite small, um, quite family-run, and those that aren't family-run have a family atmosphere actually people are really encouraging on that movement within businesses and trying out new things. I know a couple of the women I've spoken to who have started in one role and then almost been surprised when they find themselves in a completely different role because you can jump from side to side. And actually, I think that is one of the brilliant things about our industry. It's not a case of you go in as a junior something and end up as a senior. You can go in as a junior something, then go to a junior something else. And then it's such an amazing industry like that. And also the fact that because we all collaborate so well, you can actually move from company to company really easily and be supported by everybody. So I do definitely think that as an industry, that is one of the huge benefits that we have. Um, and I think if we just kind of more open to that and, and talk about all the different skills we need in our sector, then it, it definitely it's a really welcoming career opportunity for people. You talked as well about you've got 200 uh, women attending uh, that one event. You've got this really successful LinkedIn group where people feel as though they can pose those questions that they wouldn't ordinarily do so. But does that mean that there is a real gap for not just women, but anybody working in the industry to pose questions that they might think could be perceived as a bit stupid yeah. Sh shows that perhaps within companies themselves there needs to be these forums where you know simple but mm. really crucial questions are answered yeah definitely it's actually something I was reflecting on in terms of how 
um, companies themselves can um, support women within their teams. And it's something that I've really realised myself since going from only working with women to working with mostly men is that actually the needs of men and women are really different. Um, so line managing um, three boys, as I do, I call them my boys. Um, but managing men is really different to managing women. And whereas women do tend to feel more comfortable to ask the questions, men don't so much. And actually, I think it's really important that within our companies, we find out from our team members how they want to be managed, how they want to be supported. And actually, is it as simple as going back to the old suggestion box sort of scenario if people aren't that confident and comfortable to share so openly? And I think we'll find that. I think the more you can find out from your team about how they want to work, the better you can make their workplace. And the more you're going to keep them, the more people you're going to attract as well. So... I definitely think there's something to be said about having more open conversations with everyone within your team to find out what you can be doing to help them, support them and guide them. Okay, Becca, it's really fascinating. I'm glad to say you're going to be coming back a little bit later yes. for a bit more discussion. But for now, thank you very thank much. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome Chris Kelsey to the stage, President of the Stone Federation Great Britain, who's going to tell us a lot more about the big plans for the Stone Academy. Welcome, Chris. All right, thank you. Morning, everyone. Okay, the continuation of the skills in the natural stone industry and investment in the next generation of stone specialists that together make up the natural stone industry is a priority for the Stone Federation. And this is why we have launched the Stone Academy. The aim of the Academy is to provide training for the natural stone industry across the country and act as a portal for training already in existence, provide careers advice and be the first port of call for all things training in our sector. We're launching this in two phases. The first phase is being worked on at the moment and we will be signposting the existing training courses when they have all been identified, and more of this uh, a little later. This exciting new resource will form a comprehensive hub for the training in the industry, and our aim is to provide courses for the full breadth of the industry professionals, from the stonemasons and fabricators, the designers, those quarrying the materials, through to the machine operatives, and the guys fixing the materials on the sites. It will encourage the Stone Federation member companies to undertake lifetime training for their staff through a system of continual professional development and it will present career pathways of progression through a training passport to elevate the status of the industry. The overall vision is to help provide the industry with a career progression path in all the various skills in order to both attract and more importantly, retain talent within the sector. And this is a project that we're all very excited about because it is training for the industry by the industry. It will be relative training for the commercial market. It will be accessible and affordable and also up to date. We're developing the Stone Academy first with pilot schemes in the area a little closer to my heart at the moment which is the interior sector of the business. And the findings of this will be rolled out across the other sectors of the Federation starting early next year. We started the exercise by undertaking an extensive review of the training currently available within the industry. And part of this is by way of a questionnaire to our members within the interiors who collectively represent thousands of skilled people within this stone sector. Once we've analysed the results, we'll be able to look at actioning the way forward. And as I said, this is a, a very inclusive and collaborative exercise, and therefore we're working with various service providers and machine manufacturers as well, all of whom have the facilities that can be utilised to provide up-to-date training with the real machines 
CNC uh, installations, real life scenarios, rather than just classroom situations. In addition to this collaboration, we're also working closely with the Institute of Quarrying, not only on the content of the training, but to create a training and learning facility based at the National Stone Centre in Derbyshire. With the work we're doing, we're not proposing to ignore current training and we'll be using many existing courses to tune the modules to suit the level of revised and new training required. And this is where the Stone Federation will use its contacts and links with the colleges and existing providers to develop the necessary training modules. We're also working to understand the current situations by visits to as many uh, facilities as possible, such as the Bath College and the various other uh, providers of the skills training at the moment. And we'll look to increase the possibilities to use these existing resources and continue with um, schemes such as the Trailblazers as this existing format is very familiar to some of the people already involved. The quarry sector of our industry is also progressing with its training path and it's collaborating with the, the United States and learning valuable lessons from them as to how to improve the training here in the UK. Phase two of the development of the Stone Academy will also be to provide education for architects, designers, main contractors and local authorities. The Stone Federation already has an extensive programme of CPDs for architects and this will be extended through the Academy in the future. The training offered will be expanded to involve the accreditation and assessment of courses and CPDs provided by many of our members and other organisations will also be uh, considered. This will result in a comprehensive range of seminars that can be accessed by architects, specifiers, clients and those who are looking to select natural stone for their projects. And again, more details of this phase will be published later. So there you have it, the Stone Federation's vision for the future of the training in the natural stone sector. And I'm sure you will agree with me that through this collaborative and cooperative approach, working together and building on what we have and not reinventing the wheel, will greatly enhance the stone industry as the go-to choice of career with the surety of training as the way forward for progression in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot being planned for the future, but there is. what can companies do right now to get involved in what you've already set up? Um, if they can contact us with their training needs to start with, one of the things that we've found is that there are training schemes that operate for certain parts of our industry on the historic side. There are other sectors of the industry where uh, our members find it difficult to find ways and means to train their people. But if they can get in touch with us to give us some indication as to what their training needs are, we can make sure that's covered in what the Stone Academy does with the modules and how we fine tune each section of it. And are our new CPD assessments part of the Stone Academy's plans? The CPD assessments, as they progress, the old fashioned CPD, as far as the points are concerned, for what the architectural people do, is the model that you will follow with the continual professional development through the Stone Academy it will take a different format so that your base level training will come in at a sort of a bronze level. There will then be the next level of training which takes you to a silver level and then the final part of the training which will take you to a gold level. So that's where we see the career development coming from the people through. So similar on the CPDs as opposed to a point scheme, it's more based around the medal scheme. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris, okay. so far. I know you're going to be coming back in a bit just okay. to see how your plans dovetail with other needs within the industry. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Rob. You. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome onto the stage Sam Thistlethwaite, who's the Director of IC Planning, who's going to be presenting uh, local authority planning and how the natural stone industry needs to be involved in that. So take it away, Sam.
Brilliant. Can everybody hear me all right? I've got the, the headpiece. Um, yep, my name is uh, Sam Thistlethwaite. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I work for IC Planning. Um, and I've been working with the, uh, the Storm Federation for a number of years now. And what I'd like to do is just talk about something that's emerging in planning policy nationwide, which does have the potential for some positive opportunities for us as an industry, uh, particularly with a push towards improving design, which you may have, may or may not have picked up on in the, uh, in the in the press. So, yep, IC Planning we were established in 2021. We provide town planning and project management services nationwide. Um, we are planning advisors to the Stone Federation of Great Britain uh, and also its members as well, whoever would wish to, to use our services, we're, we're there to help. Um, we're quite well placed in that we do a lot of work on minerals projects, but we also do a lot of work on built development projects. So we've got a large portfolio of um, housing, regeneration projects, um, historic building uh, projects as well. So we, we work on a broad range of projects. Um, and yeah, that, that basically that's, that, that's our, anything that's planning related, it's, it's something that we're, we're here to help with and it's becoming an increasingly more and more complicated process. Uh, if any of you have had the, the dealings, uh, dealings with it recently. Um, so really what I'd like to talk about is the push for design codes. Uh, now I'll, I'll talk about where that's come from, what the implications are for us as an industry and where the opportunities are that fall from that. Um, so in terms of how we got here, um, I, I, I'm not asking anyone to put their hands up to see if they've read any of these documents, <laughs> but I'll assume you've all read them and you're all aware of them. Um, we go back to January 2020, which was the, the production of the Living with Beauty report, which in itself was the culmination of about two years worth of work. And that, that's the, 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 the remit for that report was to look at built development in general in the UK, uh, particularly house building as well, uh, and looking at this criticism that the quality of houses that are being built weren't necessarily where everybody wanted them to be. There'd been a general view that there'd been a, a diminishing uh, quality of design and the implications of that diminishing quality and what, what impact that has. But also it was quite a proactive document in that it outlined a number of measures that could be taken forward to try and address that. How could design quality be improved? What are good, what are the good, what are the elements of good design and what are the elements of bad design? Uh, so that was quite a high level document, uh, but it did have quite a lot of detail which was taken forward. Then we had the, um, the planning white paper that was produced in August 2020, which a lot of the findings from that report fed into. Now, the planning white paper was did get a lot of headline news at the time. It had, it had the grand, amongst many other things, had the grand plan to split the country into three separate land use categories. And you've got three separate sets of rules. So you basically have, don't build there. You can maybe build here and you can definitely build there. And that was the category and the world doesn't work like that. So that, that was one element that didn't make it along with a whole host of other different aspects. But one aspect that did make it through was this push for, for beauty. Uh, and the, the term beauty has become well wedded in planning policy since then. Uh, and that, that's largely been manifest in the National Model Design Code, which was produced in 2021 alongside the updated NPPF. Now, those of you who don't know what the NPPF is, it's a national planning policy framework, and that provides a set of planning policy guidelines nationwide for all forms of development. Uh, and it's loads better than it used to be. When I first started my career, all of that policy was in about 400 pages of, of text. We're now into about 90 odd pages, generally succinct, quite ambiguous in places, which keeps people like me busy. Um, but within that, the NPPF was updated to pull through some of these ideas about improving beauty. Um, and the other thing that was announced in June, which I haven't put on here, was the creation of something called the Office for Place. So this is a government body that is designed, uh, sorry, that has been set up to improve design quality uh, in new, de new developments being brought forward. I'm not going to go through the NPPF and, and all the, the captions there, but, but basically what you can take from this is that the word beautiful is now laced throughout the, the NPPF um, and also a, a need to, to bring forward design codes to help achieve that beauty. Now, planners hate anything remotely subjective. We like black and white things. You've got 20 wagons coming out of that, that, that site there, or you've got a noise level of this, anything above that is not acceptable. The planning system does struggle at times with anything that's remotely subjective. Landscape impacts, for example, are one, one such topic. 
and introducing an idea of assessing what beauty is and what beautiful is, is, is also part of that. But to address that, the government produced the National Model Design Code, which provides a framework for every local authority to produce a design code for, for every, effectively every square inch of its patch. That's a major task. So the government produced a, a National Model Design Code to allow them to, to achieve that. Um, and I've got, I've got some extracts on the, on the screen there, but this document's widely available online. It's fairly substantial and it, it's, it breaks up the whole process into a number of different stages. But right at the very front of that process is looking at an area's heritage, looking at an area and, and seeing what its positive building attributes are. And, and you find from that process that where you do have a, a high volume of natural stone being used in an area, that will automatically feed into what actually generate what, what is deemed to be a beautiful aspect of the area and what needs to be carried through into development coming forward. And now for every, every local authority, there should be a version of what you see on the screen there in that sort of level of detail, going down to the architectural features to be incorporated and the building materials to be incorporated as well. This is a major, major task for every local authority. And you, if you've ever tried to put a planning application or do anything in the, in the, 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 as needed a public service, we all know resources are stretched. And now this is not an insignificant task that's been put onto the, uh, onto the local authorities. To rectify that or to try and encourage the development of this, the government announced um, a series of uh, design code pathfinders. So local authorities were able to put forward a, a bid to say, well, we want to bring forward a design code in line with the model design, uh, the national model design code for our areas. Um, and you'll, we've got a list of the successful authorities there. Now, following on from this, a lot of other local authorities should start building their own design codes outside of this. But you can see a list there. And one of the one of the authorities that has been shown on there is um, is the Lake District National Park. Uh, and uh, we've been quite heavily involved in the production of, of that design code. Um, they are a Pathfinder authority um, and quite, um, quite um, adventurously, you could say, oh, I don't know what the right word is, um, but a bit of, um, a bit of uh, high level thinking from them, but they're, they're, they've decided to cover the entire National Park Authority with this one design code, um, throwing the fact that it is a national park it's littered with conservation areas. It's also a World Heritage Site as well. It, it's the, it is the highest bar, I would say, in terms of design quality and the, implica and the importance of, of getting the buildings right in that area, given the, the landscape quality and the urban landscape quality in particular that, uh, that's synonymous with the character of, the, land, of uh, the Lake District. And this design code that they brought forward, um, which has been re released for a public consultation draft in March, this design code is, is going to be in place to make sure that the, every new development that's brought forward is in the right shape, size, uses the right materials um, for its location. Um, so in terms of our role, representing the Stone Federation, we've been involved in the production of this document uh, since last year, since it started the original drafting. Uh, we've also been in attendance with some local stone suppliers as well, who have been really, really helpful to that process. Um, the level of local knowledge that they bring uh, to those discussions was better than anything else that anybody else had sat around that table, um, especially more than the, the local planning authority um, who, who knew some of it but didn't really know the, the history and didn't have the level of detail that the, the local stone suppliers had. And that, that, that has really benefited the whole design code process for the Lake District as, as part of those discussions. Um, before the publication of the draft in March, we were involved in multiple design code meetings, uh, which was a forum event. Some were held in person, some were held in teams, held over teams. And we were there alongside architects. Um, we were there alongside local developers as well who had, uh, who were bringing forward both private and public and um, uh, social housing within the Lake District. And we were there alongside the Environment Agency and other stakeholders, including United Utilities, who have a, a, big, a big stake in the Lake District with uh, some of their assets up there. Um, what we have got in March is uh, is a fairly large 270 odd page design code, which covers absolutely everything from how high the fences need to be all the way through to the roofing materials and wall materials, which are really helpful from our point of view. But it covers every aspect that parking regulations, you name it. There is a, there's a target to have a summer um, summer 2023 adoption for the document. 
and then it will apply to all planning applications for every development brought forward from conservation uh, conservatory extension all the way through to brand new housing developments. Um, to give you an indication of the level of detail that we've gone into, um, the, the, the images you'll see on the screen there, the panel can't make out the, uh, the, the images on the, uh, on the screen there, but basically what you've got there are two images where they've actually used the, 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 the stone quality, stone color and quality to highlight the areas where that's used. Now the image on the, the left-hand side of the screen shows the, the building wall materials. Um, so you've obviously got a sandstone, you've got um, slate stone as well, and you've got cobble used sporadically, and they've, they've assigned different areas to where that, that has formed the local vernacular. And then the image on the right-hand side shows the roofing materials, so the different types of slates that have been used, and you can see alongside Windermere to the, uh, the eastern side, you've got the, uh, the darker sto the slate, and then um, around Keswick as well, but then the wider the Lake District, you've got the, the lighter stone as well that's been used. And it's that level of detail that they've gone down to within the design code. And that's resulted in the, in the, the captions that you see on the screen there. Now, these are, um, these are just text examples that are taken from within the design code itself. Uh, and these highlight how developers should be looking at bringing forward new development. And you can see there's a clear emphasis on the use of local stone, local natural stone, a resistance of using um, any artificial substitutes um, and then you've got a typical street scene from new development that's been brought forward which has incorporated quite a modern look to the building but also has fallen back and used some of that traditional material as well so that's so the design code is full of helpful examples like that of how things can be be uh, be brought forward and, and how the design codes can be brought forward using uh, local stone so some of the, the key learning points and issues um, Design codes as a principle have had a mixed perception. Um, you can see that from our perspective, we're looking at it and can see that there's some, some clarity over the expectations for the, from the council's perspective on the types of stone to be used. Generally, architects weren't massively keen on them because it provides a bit of a straight jacket as to, to what they can achieve, although there is some scope to, for, for, for architects to, to, to apply some flair if they want to. Um, but it, it is, some seem to see it as being quite uh, prescriptive. The viability concerns, particularly the, um, particularly from the those that are dealing in register, uh, doing RSL development, registered social landlord and social housing, that margins are already very very tight on those types of development, particularly in high value areas like the Lake District. Adding another layer of design um, code compliance to that will have a cost implication. Uh, the Lake Districts, from their point of view, have looked at it and taken the view that the design quality is so important to. The Lake District, its its designations and how it feels, that that is a discussion they're willing to have. But design quality is right right up there in terms of their priorities. Um, but you can imagine that in some other areas where that isn't the case, where it isn't a national park, that those viability discussions are going to going to be quite quite heated. Um, there's also the discussions that were had in those in those meetings that we had about. Being able, the local stone supplies to be able to to hold up their end of the bargain to make sure that there is a supply available to support the developments that are being brought forward, um, and that was quite quite an interesting discussion. Having and and the council wanting those reassurances that that there is a supply there that if they do make this commitment to enforce that this is the type of stone that needs to be on all developments brought forward that that that, that the suppliers can deliver it. Um, and that included looking at where there were alternatives if those supplies weren't available, what, what other alternatives could be acceptable in those circumstances. Um, because the design code in itself is a planning document, it does have to look at some of the wider issues and the sustainability of the materials as well is a, is a major, major factor. And it's something that, that we had to do quite a lot of education of the local planning authority to explain the relevant carbon footprints for all the stone that's being supplied and how that compares both with other forms of uh, material, which you can see, which has resulted in the, uh, the, the image you can see on the, uh, the right hand side of the screen there. Um, so looking at other forms of development, sorry, other forms of materials, but also looking at the same material being sourced from other locations. So looking at slate that is, for example, brought in from Spain or much more further afield and, and assigning a carbon value to that. And that information is embedded within the uh, design code. Um, it is a detailed document, it's 270 odd pages, uh, it's not the clearest to navigate. 
it needs a lot of streamlining. Um, I understand it's being brought forward and it'll be rolled out on a web-based system, so it will be a lot more navigable. Uh, but the version that we've seen is is pretty inhospitable to, to anybody trying to find uh, find what you're needing. Um, and finally, just picking up on a point that I made earlier, that the the local planning authority's knowledge of the materials that that they've got and that have been used to build some of the buildings that they um, that they have that they they value that knowledge doesn't necessarily follow through to where that material has been sourced. And that there is a huge education piece that we as an industry can play in making sure that the right stones uh, and materials are brought forward in the right locations. And I would, I'd encourage anybody that has, that believes that this, this, what I've outlined here applies to an area that they supply stone into to, to be proactive and engage with the local planning authority because they are now all having to prepare these documents. So there's a real opportunity now to get into the ground floor with this and make sure that you've got, like we have done with the Lake District, and get your particular stone types included within the legislation. Now, it won't apply to everywhere, because there'll be some areas where, where there isn't natural stone use, but there will be some areas. And I, and we do appreciate the Lake District is, is the poster boy for this because of its designations and the type of material that's been used. But there will be a lot of other areas where we can apply this. Um, so I really would I'd, I'd say there's an opportunity there now if you're proactive about it. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Sam, thank you very much. So, as you say, there are real layers of complexity, but do you think overall this actually could present a real opportunity for the stone industry, this real focus on beauty? Yeah, massively. It's, it's not going away. It's been... Um, the lawyers don't like it, and, and some planners don't like it because the term beauty is very subjective, but it, it, is, it has survived... The cull on the, the planning white paper, which got rid of a lot of a lot of um, high level ideas, but it is well and truly set in in motion now, and it is part of the planning process. There's a there was a consultation earlier this year on a on a draft new NPPF, and that requirement for beauty has only been increased more. Um, there's it's a big thing for planning, but changing the title of a chapter in the <laughs> in the in the the NPPF to to include the word beauty is a big deal, and it, that, it, it's only going in one way. So I do think there is a it, it, it's a great opportunity for us. And we're starting to see that um, with the work that we do in the Lake District and with other local authorities, we can see that there are opportunities to be had. But do you think there is going to be this geographical split that really emerges between areas where there is great potential and areas where you can just simply get mired in a lot of difficulty with these price pressures, constraints on so many local authorities now? Totally. It is, it is not a one size fits all approach. We it will only apply to, and you'll know the authorities that, you, that, that you're dealing with in the areas that you operate in. So it won't apply to inner city of London, although it may do in some certain locations and certain streets, but um, new towns, for example, they, they, they won't necessarily be the same requirements, um, but it's, it's finding the opportunities and where they are, because where we do find those opportunities, we are finding that we're pushing on an open door to help the local planning authority to make sure that that material is, is specified in the planning documents. And once you've got it in black and white, the planning document, it's um, it's a very valuable tool and it, it makes life a lot clearer and simpler for, for the planning authority as well as, uh, as potential developers. OK, that's great. Well, thank you. Do come and take a seat because I know um, if you sit there, I'm just going to grab you a, a microphone. And could you um, come up as well to the panel, uh, Becca and Chris? Thank you very much. So... <laughs> It kind of dovetails nicely into the next point in that if you say, um, Sam, that actually there is a kind of lack of knowledge within local authorities about the stone that's used that they are really upholding about the sourcing of that, maybe they should be coming to attend uh, the Stone Federation's Academy. Could you foresee a future whereby you could run courses potentially for local authority planning departments so that they fully understand um, sourcing in particular there's no reason why why they can't come to the to the training um one aspect that we touched on with the cpds that we use is that the architectural colleges planning colleges universities they can all benefit from the the type of training that we're proposing to do the training that's given to architects and planners at the moment on natural stones for their availability, their use, um, the specification of the correct materials is very poor. They don't get enough education. 
and there's there's a big void there that we believe with the collaboration with the other parts of the of the industry the institute of quarrying and the minerals planning there should be a much more broader education and training to be given to the professionals that ultimately give decisions on what can and can't be used on the basis of knowledge that they've not got. So the more training you can do for that, the better they'll be to advise and then comment on what people are proposing to do. Would you concur, do you think that, that that's true, that there is this real gap of knowledge? Where else do you think uh, the knowledge base really needs to have a gr greater foundation? In, in planning in general or uh, yeah, yeah there is a, there is I, I totally agree with that that the, we have a we have a real problem with skills retention in the planning system um, and it's been on the decline since 2008 2009 um, and it's been really acutely felt in the, in the minerals department so there is a there is a major issue there but more widely in the planning system we have a, we have a skills issue uh, we have a major recruitment issue we know ourselves we're advertising for two new people to join and it's we're struggling um, but there is a there's a major education piece. Uh, minerals planning, in particular, is, is not necessarily seen as seems quite intimidating to those that work in uh, the planning system. Think it's it's really difficult and quite um, they're quite apprehensive about getting involved. But it's really just digging holes. It's not really <laughs> not, nothing more complicated than that. And, and, and highways movements at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I fully agree. That there's a skills issue, and I think there's a role for us as, an, as the industry to to help and do that. We can't just sit at the sidelines and critique it and say, well, it's no good. My planning application is taking too long or this person doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, you've got to, you've got to be, we as an industry, you've got to be proactive about it. And I know Institute of Quarrying have done bits and pieces. I know the other um, industry bodies have done work. The RTPI, which I'm a, a member of and as a former regional chair of the RTPI, which is the, the Royal Town Planning Institute, we have a, an annual meeting every year on minerals planning, but also we, we are heavily involved in the Northeast in particular in doing a, a dedicated minerals event up there. So yeah, I, skill shortage is a major issue. Um, and then it's it's compounded by it being, it, more general there's a skills issue in planning, but it's compounded particularly in minerals planning, definitely. Um, but uh, I think with things like the push for design, there's a need for planners to not necessarily dismiss that as being a niche. It, it's being brought more and more into the mainstream, I think. Now picking up as well, um what Chris was saying in his presentation. Becca, you highlighted that there are kind of, you know, knowledge gaps um, for women in particular who might be coming into the industry. They feel reticent about uh, coming forward to request uh, uh, that knowledge and that guidance. What did you hear from Chris with the plans for the academy that, that could help? And what kind of courses do you think might really help move the dial? I think um, having spoken to Chris separately about this as well before, um, one of the things that there is still a gap in is is that training and, and knowledge, the kind of almost like the basic understanding of stone that you need to come into any career within the stone industry. I think what, that was one of the things that I found was there was nothing I could really go to that kind of gave me the basics of everything you need to know. You'd end up kind of fishing around for loads of detail and, and it's great that you've got your MVQs and all your kind of apprenticeships and proper qualifications for people that are going to go and actually do the hands-on masonry, for example. But if you're going to be involved in stone in any way, you need to just have the, the real basics of understanding, no matter what role you're in within the company, whether you're in accounting, whether you're in marketing, whether you, whatever you do, it's having that basic understanding. I know that that's something that they're looking to develop within the, the Stone Academy as well, is, is that opportunity for us to all just know the, the, the little things we need to know. I mean, I talk to stone suppliers all the time because we deal directly with them as a company. As, yeah, as a company. And it's incredible the limited knowledge that some of these people selling the stone actually have about natural stone. Um, they've got the transferable sales skills because they've come from a sales background. But there isn't anywhere they can go to just get the basic 101 on natural stone um, and the difference between quartz and quartzite and kind of what to expect from marble when you sell it. And I think that's a gap that's really missing and something that the Stone Academy can definitely plug um, at a real basic level for everyone in the industry. Is that achievable, becoming a treasure trove of knowledge for natural stone? It would have to be quite an extensive uh, database wouldn't it? It'd be a hell of a treasure chest yeah <laughs> it, it would um, if if you 
think about the industry that we've got at the moment, there is an imbalance in the knowledge that's within the people within the trade. As, as I've progressed through the trade and learned and found out a lot of information up to the point of my career where I'm at, there were a lot of youngsters coming through that you were then going to be trained and educated. There's, there's a gap at the moment and a lot of knowledge that, that people have within all the various companies that we've got in each sector of the industry, that knowledge is going to disappear without it being passed down to other people. And if you don't actually um, give the benefit of your experience to these people, for them to understand how we've got to where we are within the industry, then mistakes will be made, materials will be lost, and we won't have a trade for the future. People look at, at the natural stone industry and the dimensional stone industry, and they don't necessarily understand the differences between the different types of quarrying that's done. At the moment, there are minerals being extracted and used for lots of big government subsidized infrastructure projects that are basically given the go-ahead part blanche. In the dimensional industry, we take a lot more care, we take a lot more attention to what we're doing, because rather than going into a hole and putting a load of explosive in and blowing it into bits to then use it for other things, what we see in the hole is a value. So everything that we take out of the ground, we want to actually convert into a product so that somebody will use and will enjoy for many, many years to come. In the quarrying and the development of our industry, that is done with a lot of care and attention. Um, and the guys that run these quarries pride themselves and have the passion on taking something out of the ground and converting it to something beautiful. So we understand the need, but how do you capture that knowledge? How do you then distill what they know into um, a form which is easy accessible for the next generation. You have to change where we're going at the moment with the, the progression from the schools that go into uh, colleges and the draw of universities that everybody seems to think they need a degree and have got to go to university. Not everybody's skilled enough intellectually to go to have a degree. But how do you attract them? Let, let me put that point to you Sam. You, yeah, you talk about um, the fact that you have a shortage in, you know, in the planning uh, sector. So how do you then easily demonstrate why this is an industry that those young people um, that Chris is talking about, you know, should forego university and go straight, straight into the industry, onto training schemes that are offered? What, what needs to be the draw and how can we create that draw? It's quite heavy. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> the planning. We, yeah. Oh God, what do we do? Um, it, it's. I think it's. It's about educating the opportunity. I think. Um, I came into planning through geography. I really like geography. I and uh, I did a geography A level. I did a geography degree. But I think if people make, but no one ever told me that if you if you do geography, most people think you can become a teacher, and that's the only route you can go down. Um, but no one ever really told me that you could be a town planner, which is largely doing a geography course full time. You're looking at human geography, you're looking at natural geography. Um, so there is a role to play. And we, we do, we work with local colleges and we, we, we town planning is difficult because you've got to have, um, you could have a degree to have an RTPI chartership, but that's not the only way of, of getting people involved in the industry. You don't necessarily have to have that accreditation. You can get that through work experience over the longer term. So we are working with colleges um, and we are part of a wider business that is uh, rotates around. So we take college students that work three months with us, then they'll work with an architect, then they'll, and they, they work in the built development. And within that, we do give them an education on, on planning. But it's, um, it's really making that connection. And, and, and for the planning system in general, it's, it's explaining exactly what it's about. It's not just dealing with objections to yeah. people's conservatories. It's it's more than that and it's there's an education there. you could potentially get more people into planning what about the stone industry well, we don't have long left but i'd like to give you the last word becca how do you think actually that perhaps the stone industry should market itself more to try and attract that talent that it needs yeah massively i think um as an industry there is a huge huge opportunity to 
to be more open and kind of I was saying this to somebody the other day I think as an industry it's great that we all have lovely Instagram accounts that might show a beautiful bathroom that we've put together or look at this house or whatever it, that's fantastic however one thing we're missing is the people and actually showcasing those stories like did you know you didn't have to just go do your geography and become a teacher like it, it people buy people people buy stories like that is what people want to see and I think young people in particular that's what they want to see like I'm not going to go and want to work for a stone company in their marketing department or as, as an accountant if I'm just seeing slabs of stone look at what we've got into the stone yard that is beautiful don't get me wrong you've got to market your products but if you want to market the industry the company we all need to be working together and kind of showcasing what the industry who the industry is what the people behind the industry are um and and showcasing that to young people one of the things we are looking to do with women in natural stone is forge some links with colleges schools and, and whatever it might be but we've got to be visible. We can't just kind of talk about it and kind of share our stories amongst ourselves, as lovely as that is. Um, actually, let's share those stories with other people. Let's all work together to do that as an industry. I think we are a very collaborative industry and it's a common problem we have. We struggle with recruitment. We're a small business. Large businesses struggle with recruitment. Um, so we should be working together on that to tackle it. And I think it is about selling the people not just the products and services that we provide but the products themselves are a pretty good sustainable oh we all mean we all so, love you know that is products. yeah that's, <laughs> that in itself is, is quite a draw for people who just you yeah. know improve the the, the the environment so thank you very much it is all we have time for it's a big subject uh, and i look forward to hearing about all the progress so good. thank you very much thank you thank you